Good evening and welcome to the Literaturhaus Berlin. Uh, my name is Sonja Longulius and I welcome you here at the Literaturhaus but also in the live stream. Um, I'm very happy tonight is uh, the last event before our summer break and it is a very special event that I'm looking forward to since many weeks and months actually. Um, Lina Meruana is today with us and also Priya Basil Unfortunately, only digitally. Most of you will probably understand uh, what happened. She cannot join us today physically because of the big C, as I only call it nowadays. Um, but she is doing well, and she will be uh, with us tonight for a dialogue about becoming a feminist. And um, I would like to welcome, first of all, Lina Meruane back to our stage. She was here four years ago, and it's, it's a great honor that you're here tonight with us. Um, she is the Samuel Fischer Guest Professor at the moment at, at the Freie Universität Berlin. And I would also like to thank our partners tonight. It's the Freie Universität Berlin, the German Academic Exchange Service, the AAD, the uh, S. Fischer and Holzbrink Berlin Inspire together. And I'm very honored and happy that we can do this event tonight together. Um, yes, without further ado, I would like to give the word to Priya Basile, who is connected with us. You will see her in a moment. And I wish you two a wonderful conversation and you a wonderful evening. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Um, so, cause it's all gone silent for me now, but I think that's because the other microphones are turned off. But maybe if, if Lena can give me a thumbs up that uh, you can hear me, then I, I know this. Okay, good. Well, um, I'm really delighted that I can join this way um, because uh, in these times, um, we have become remarkably agile about these moments, but I have to really thank the Literature House for just that very short notice, um, giving us the possibility to come together in this hybrid format. Thank you so much, Sonia, for um, being so understanding and flexible. Thank you, Lena, also for agreeing to this slightly odd setup. Um, and uh, thank you. I would also like to say thank you to the people at Holtzbring for really supporting this event for, for months now, taking care of us and uh, bringing all of us together this evening. So. Um, I'm, I was actually initially asked to moderate this conversation and then Lena very generously said to me, no, let's be in a conversation um, and not talk about a specific book, but talk about something that really interests us both and that has united us both over a longer period. So we will be in conversation, but um, so but it doesn't end up being just a very personal conversation and we, we get sort of lost in each other as, as uh, people who know each other for a long time can. I will, I will steer a bit and, and manage some practicalities. And um, Lina and I actually met in 2010 in Berlin. Um, she was uh, here at the time and uh, taking part in the International Literature Festival Berlin where I had organized a 24 hour reading for, uh, to celebrate International Peace Day. And she was one of the around 80 authors who took part. And um, that was the beginning of our acquaintance which developed into a friendship um, over the years and really also an intellectual exchange. Um, I had the honor to be there when Lena won the Anna Segas Prize in um, 2011 and um, to attend the prize ceremony and then to begin to read her books as they were translated into English. Unfortunately, I, I can't read Spanish, but um, here translation is uh, the wonder that it gives us the possibility to share our work with each other. And um, she has read my work too and um, been a great influence on me in different ways. And so I feel very privileged and um, very fortunate to be able to have this kind of public conversation with her. Um, and with all of you. We would love to invite questions from you um, at some stage um, in the course of this evening. So please um, hold on to any reactions, reflections, and uh, questions that come to you, and please save them for the end, because it would be great to get into a, a bigger dialogue as well. Um, there's a, I can see a nice amount of people in the room, and it, it seems like a very good um, size for us to, to converse. Um, we, we thought, as the event's description suggests, that we would begin with talking a bit about our early work and how um, 
yeah, the kinds of characters we were writing um, got us thinking about gender dynamics. And uh, Lena, I wanted to ask you actually to begin with, what was driving the way that you wrote female characters um, early on? Um, I think you're probably very well known to most people for Seeing Red, which is uh, ruled for Argon in German, but you had written short stories, plays, other things before then. So it would be really nice to get an insight into how um, you arrived at um, the character Lena in Road for Algen, who is a very feminist character, I would say. So thank you. Thank you so much, Priya. Uh, I am so delighted to see you and see you well. Um, uh, I'm happy that we can still engage in this conversation. Thanks to the technology developed in the last two years. Um, so anyway, so I'm very glad to see you. I also want to say that uh, thank you for being here. Thanks to the institutions that already have been mentioned and are hosting us today. Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with the, the warmth of the room. I, I know it's uh, with all the lights on, etc. but I'm sure that in five minutes it'll become a little bit fresher. Um, <clears throat> so yes, Priya and I have become good friends and collaborators over the years. And I thought that it would be really nice to have a dialogue with her. I thought that it was a more feminist thing to do than having somebody interview somebody else. And because we are both writers, we're both essayists, uh, we've both done a pretty amount of teaching, uh, and we're both friends, I thought that it would be more horizontal and, and, and sort of a, ha a happier event. Um, and so uh, answering your question, dear Priya, um, so I wanted to start with a little bit of an anecdote. Um, I think I was a, 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 I became or started becoming a feminist very uh, far back in my life, very young, uh, when feminism was really not the word to uh, use to catalog yourself. And it was a really strange uh, event, which was seeing the picture of my grandmother who would now be probably around 100, graduating from law school. So the picture looked, it was interesting. There were two women sitting on two chairs, well-dressed, and behind them there were something like 150 men standing up wearing suits. I went to a co-ed school. We were 50-50, more or less. And so I thought, why are they so few women? I hadn't even thought of this. Then, of course, I learned that there was a quota for women for a very, very long time, especially in careers for men. I think that was the first time I was completely shocked by learning, and this was when I was like maybe 10 or 12 years old, shocked by learning that women did not have the same chances, and that my grandmother not only had finished a career, but had interrupted it because she had become a mother and a single mother. So I think that really sort of put all my red lights on, and from then on, I was aware and thinking about the situation of women. So that really, I think, has triggered a lot of my, re my posterior reflection on, on, uh, on being a woman, and also especially being a woman in, prof in the profession. Um, somebody who has written a lot about this is, of course, Virginia Woolf, but I was really, really interested in thinking what happens what happens to women when they become professionals? Why are there no professional women in books, at least in my time of reading? Why can't I find books written by women, which was the other question was when I started writing? And um, also, when does this happen, that women sort of some, suddenly know that they can't be equals to their male partners? And this is when I thought about childhood, and, uh, and I, that's really the origin of my first book. It's a book of short stories which are sort of connected to each other, and it's about these girls who are disciplined to become uh, good women and who actually escape that uh, design. And that's, that's really how that happened, because I had really thought about this before. And then all the rest of my books are really starred by women in different situations. Uh, some, some of them are more feminist, and some of them, I would say, defy some of the good feminist convention, because there is a 
good woman convention and there's also a good feminist convention. And I try to really think through these conventions, which can be equally complicated. We have a word in Spanish and we, this is, I don't know how to translate this, but it's having a feministometro, which is like a measure of feminism. Like who is the best feminism, who, who is the best feminist, etc. So this is how things came to place. I don't know how those were for you. So let me return that question to you, Priya. That is so interesting. And it makes total sense because your sort of, um, yes, yeah, strong sense of um, being a feminist was really present when I met you. I think, I think that was one of the, like you, you're maybe one of my first role models. You could say I led a very sheltered life in certain ways, but um, I feel like in a way my trajectory is so different because I became alert to these things much, much later. Um, although now I realize I notice things, but without understanding or, or having the, the, the language to describe. And I think this is what feminist critique and discourse gives us sometimes. It gives us the language to recognize things that we experience without understanding why it is that certain patterns are, are, are repeating. Um, I, one thing that I, I really felt, you know, when I met you and, when, and, and through reading your work, um, that you, you made me think about this question, like, is there anywhere the imagination cannot go or is there anywhere literature cannot go? Um, this is what uh, reading your book, um, Seeing Red, left me thinking because um, what, what you said about the, the good woman and the good feminist, uh, here is a character, Lena, who is so daring in different ways and pushes at so many of the boundaries of what we think is acceptable or not. Um, I remember one one thought she has, and when she says at one point, I've already imagined everything unthinkable. And this was for me such an incredible thought because I have the feeling that for some a lot of my life, I was sort of hiding from my own thoughts almost. Like there were things I just was not ready to really look at and interrogate. And this question of what is a feminist was definitely one of them. I was a bit terrified of this term and and what it meant. Um, I think you're right that it it, ha it was connotated very differently um, until maybe five, ten years ago, and definitely since the Me Too movement, um, that has has changed a lot. Um, but uh, this this sense of um, yeah, this readiness to kind of probe and search and expose um, is something that I think belongs to uh, a feminist way of, um, of thinking and striving in the world. And um, for me, I, I, had, I grew up with very different um, women figures around me. So my grandmother, who's a very dominant, loud, um, really assertive woman. And so when she's in the room, nobody else gets a word in edgeways and uh, she always seems to get her way, you know, and uh, for me as a young woman, I realized that as, as a girl, even growing up, I, I was so in awe of her. I was so enchanted by her because she was the only woman who I saw who had this sort of charisma and this daring. Um, and then there was my mother who had a very different way of dealing with things. She was much more and is sort of um, uh, just quieter. And, and she just had to maneuver differently also because of the kind of mother she had. And so these different poles of, you know, the sort of quietness and the loudness and what it meant to speak or to not speak and, and how, you know, in a society that I came from, which was so much about keeping face and not speaking about things um, that had come, that had happened, like uh, whether acts of, um, of violence or just um, injust other kinds of injustice. Um, th these questions had been shaping me all along, but I think I didn't really begin to think about how um, until around 10 years ago. Um, and then really in a very, from a very explicit feminist lens, um, only around five years ago, uh, partly related to me too, um, but also related to uh, the moment of Brett Kavanaugh getting on the Supreme Court. I mean, it's very strange also what events in the world kind of trigger our own consciousness and our own development. 
it seemed very odd that I had to wait for some American event to really start to think about what does this term feminist mean for me? Because I suddenly felt like I have to position myself and I didn't know what to do with this term. I felt it was really daunting. And so um, I sort of dedicated myself to trying to grapple with it and, um, and understand it and find a way of thinking about it where I could say I'm a feminist um, without, uh, yeah, without worrying too much. Priya, <clears throat> let me ask you this question because this is something that you know, I, I heard when I was growing up saying a feminist was like passé, right? This is why would why would one call oneself that if everything is solved, especially maybe for women of the middle classes or the upper classes. Uh, but I was wondering what changed? When did, for you, calling yourself a feminist become a good word rather than a bad word? Or at least not such a um, such a, I don't know, threatening word? Or, or, did, or did that not change, but you were sort of more able to engage? That's a really good question. And I think both parts of what you say are, are true. I think what changed was the sense that a lot is at stake. Um, I think with uh, Kavanaugh getting onto the Supreme Court, and then we, we see the results of that now, and we'll talk about that later, um, there was the sense that all these rights, which you had just thought that they have a certain trajectory and, you know, there will these rights are guaranteed and there will just be more and more um, possibilities um, for women and uh, for people with different sexual orientations, for people of color, it, it, th th this assumption of, you know, the arc of progress and truth, um, this was for me really shaken up. And I thought um, I couldn't just rely on other people doing the work, other people engaging with these questions. Like I had to figure out my own position. And the only way to do that, it seemed to me, was to really actually embrace this word and to think about how um, it could mean something to me and where I stood in this very big field um, called feminism. Um, and so uh, it, it is still daunting, but not, I don't feel scared of it. And I don't feel scared of like the, uh, I mean, I think another reason that it became accessible has to do with the fact that it has become a bit commodified. Um, I mean, it's a kind of form of branding also. Um, and this is what capitalism does. It takes even the most radical things and can repackage them. Um, so you can, you can wear it and feel really good without anything actually changing. Um, but the advantage of that is that when something becomes very accessible, it also, it's, it's, you don't fear it so much anymore. And so I think there's this kind of, um, uneasy, uneasy sense I have about um, how, how commonly the term is used now and how easily it's thrown around. And at the same time, I think for me, that, that that's also what helped me grab onto it, even if I then have to really kind of interrogate it and try to, to, to actually accept its multifacetedness, unwieldiness and contradictions. I mean, what about you? I mean, because if you started with this very strong sense of um, identification uh has that remained uh strong or have you has there have there been ambiguities and, and periods of sort of uncertainty with this uh, uh category or this concept um i think that um although i called myself a feminist being young um i didn't really know exactly what it meant um and my sort of my trajectory is to, has been to really figure out what it means to be a feminist. Uh, of course, we cannot speak of feminism being one thing any longer, right? Uh, we actually now say the word in plural, feminisms, uh, because that has given more space uh, for women who believe in equality, for people who have 
rethought women who have actually rethought feminism as coming from the middle upper classes white women with privilege and sort of opening opening up the question of the difference in race and place right that has become so important and then adding to that of course all the different uh, movements that have included people uh, with a different uh, sexual orientation, different genders, uh, et cetera, right? So there is a, a plethora of feminisms today which has called me to think where I stand within all these movements. And so I think that rather than becoming a feminist in the word, what happened to me was having to think through all of these complex categories that live within feminism and what I called... I call sometimes the feminists who are not feminists, uh, that use the word feminism but are really not, right? And those categories become nuanced and difficult to figure out. So let me just explain what I mean by this. So coming from the two extremes of how hard it is to be a feminist and feminism being a bad word and then becoming such a trendy word that has been co-opted, as you said, by uh, capitalism, I think that there's sort of problems on the two extremes. So because one thing that has become very prevalent under capitalism is that feminism has been equated to the, cho the, the freedom of choice. I can choose for myself. Where when we think I and we think myself, we're thinking of actually individualism of me thinking as a woman how I can do better for myself. Um, how can I overcome my struggle as a woman, you know, in the workplace, in my family, and choose what I like. And I'm not against the word choosing, but I think that that liberty of choice that some of us as more privileged women have needs to be sort of somehow compensated or put vis-a-vis -vis what happens to the others. This, for me, this sort of thinking about myself within the community of others, and not only women, but all the other vulnerable people that we uh, see every day and that we work with or that work for us, is a very, very important question. So I think that there has been a sort of a uh, an instrumentalization, a capitalist instrumentalization of feminism where women are doing exactly the same things, some, uh, that a man would do, right? Become successful um, and forget about the rest. Uh, and my success is my proof that I am, uh, you know, a, a liberated woman. So that I think is very dangerous in the discourse. And what I have come down to think is that actually the feminism that I am interested in, the feminism that I call feminism, is a more radical stance, a more communitarian stance, and of course, I, I don't like to use these big words, but what we call today intersectionality, meaning I am a feminist that worries about women who have belong to a different class, to a different race, uh, women who suffer different sorts of violence, um, and also men, right? And also men, because the category of men is also not one. The category of men is also multiple, and as a friend of mine likes to say, um, patriarchy has damaged everybody, men and women. So I think that it's sort of a, a larger question today, which I, as a feminist, am called to address. And that's, of course, a lot of work. And it's difficult, and one fails, and then rethinks the position and then tries to do it better. So in that way also I think of a feminism that believes in uh, pedagogy, I don't know if I'm saying this word right in English, but uh, sort of a more... Pedagogy. Hmm? Pedagogy. Pedagogy, rather than punishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really resonates. Um, with me and uh, I remember there was so I had the the kind of uh, amazing um, uh, gift of having um, Lena read the manuscript uh, a draft of my uh, feminism book 
And I remember one section, Lena, which you helped me to hone just with your comments. Um, and uh, hearing you speak now, I realize how close it is to what you just articulated because this, on this question of choice, because I was interrogating this capitalism um, uh, sort of sheen um, on feminism and, uh, and its problems. And um, and this question of choice and and so what what th through the sort of discussion we had the way I ended up articulating is 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 that truly feminist choices are about justice so the decisions that don't just make things better for you but also for others and um, I think that's just really encapsulates what you you know so so beautifully expressed and. Um, this this notion of becoming um i think it's it, for me it's also really important because it sort of implies that there's no end like you don't arrive somewhere and it's like this is the kind of feminist i am but that it's a process of continuously sort of rethinking um and questioning one's assumptions and goals and methods and then tr trying again as you said failing like what being in different constellations with different thinking with different kinds of people acting with different kinds of people and so the, the notion of becoming seems to me to be a really fruitful one i mean generally um but particularly in 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 the feminist cause um i i also felt as though i could never have dared to start writing a book on feminism if i thought this has to be my conclusive last word on it I, I would have failed before I started. Um, but, and it was only like being in this exploratory mode and really sort of seeing myself in relation to many different positions, even ones that I don't share, because I think we are defined almost as much by the things that we don't agree with as, as the ones that we do. Um, and, and I think this movement is, as you described, so sort of um, varied and multifaceted and has so many dimensions. Um, but if I'm, I find it very exciting actually to kind of to see oneself in relation to all these different parts of it and to think, okay, what does that do uh, to the argument? What, what does that do? Um, and one of the things that, that helped with trying to articulate that in writing, because I think this is also something very interesting, like what language and what forms do we find to express this, um, this way of, of thinking and being this feminist way was a sort of polyphonic um, uh, approach. So I, I quote a lot and um, I, I have lots of different voices that make up um, the text. And I know you are also uh, an avid and generous quoter and you're always acknowledging um, different thinkers and different writers in your work. And I find that such a, a, a wonderful and feminist thing because this whole idea of the sort of lone genius working and coming up with something that's like purely original just seems to me so dated and false. And uh, this, this, this being in a line or in, in, men, in circles of thinkers and acknowledging the way in which, you know, our thoughts are built from other thoughts and our actions are built on other actions. Um, I think it's also part of the endeavor and, um, and I feel like in your writing too, this this sense of acknowledgement um, is really uh, is, is really important and is really built into the way you express yourself. Um, <clears throat> speaking speaking of which, I think that you, you mentioned something really important, sort of this these texts that are stopping to be just about the eye and are becoming more of a dialogue of a. Uh, a polyphonic voice uh, where not all of the voices need to be in accord, right? There can be disagreement, which I think is a super powerful word. I think we're not very used to disagreement and to having an exchange of ideas where sometimes people don't, are not in agreement. But also I would like to mention that your text in particular touched me because it's so much about the question of pleasure. Are we entitled to have fun? Are we entitled to feel good? Are we entitled to expressing happiness, right? And it seems, I think for a very long time, feminism seemed to be so much a question of like anger, which I'm not against. Mm -hmm. I, I think I write better when I'm angry actually. Mm -hmm. but, but it seemed that, that sort of uh, feminism was kind of weighed down by this like angry feminists complaining all the time, right? 
And I thought that your text brought in something that was interesting because it was a community, but also it was a community of women having fun together, enjoying being together. And I thought that that was, it sort of felt like you were responding to a very old question uh, poised by Virginia Woolf when she says in a room of one's own, uh, I am here at the, at the British Library and I'm trying to find uh, books by women, I can't really find many. And the women who appear in the books by men never seem to be with each other, having fun with each other. They seem to be competing for another man, right? Or, or absolutely absent or absolutely uh, without a subjectivity, right? So that question is like, where are the women enjoying the friendship of each other and having fun and just laughing, right? That the sort of the transgressiveness of pleasure and of laugh. And I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting take on feminism. On the one hand, there's all these questions and there are all these sometimes disagreements and rethinking of problems, but then also the having fun with each other, which I thought was great. Respond to that or, or maybe read, so maybe read. Um, yeah, I, 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 I will read, but I, I just um, wanted to just add to that because I think it, it, it also echoes a bit what I find um, it, in your work because this idea of the sensual dimension also of experience um, and that these intellectual questions can actually be explored in really physical ways. I mean, I think reading your work is often a very physical experience, I mean, partly because you really delve into the body in different ways. Um, I, I remember when you told me people have ended up with eye infections after reading, um, uh, seeing red, and it's, it's, it's really, um, yeah, visceral. Um, and I think that this is also something that I really, was inspired by in your work and in, in other kind of um, feminist writing that the, the intellectual and the sensual are not separate places, that they, um, they coexist together in, in, in very interesting and very fruitful um, uh, and pleasurable and uh, meaningful ways. And to find ways of writing that, um, I think, is, um, is really exciting, actually. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to try and do. And I'm really happy that um, the second part of my book, which uh, describes this experience of um, trying to hijack uh, an edition of Vogue magazine with 39 women, um, sort of uh, transported that. Um, but you're right, this would be a really good moment to read since we are talking about literature and um, to, to give a sense of the sounds that um, our, our text uh, can have. Um, would you like to go first, Lena? And then um, I, will, I will follow. Sure. Pri, I wanted to also tell you that um, I think we need to speak just a tiny little bit slower because sometimes uh, words are a little bit sort of off. So uh, I am also going to try to read slowly and uh, maybe that is helpful. I don't know if you're having issues uh, getting... No, you're not? Okay, so maybe it's me because I'm sitting here and you are getting the microphone in a different direction, so forget about it. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm just going to read a, a, a page and a half, actually, a page of uh, my last book, uh, which uh, I wrote here in Berlin. Interestingly, my last two novels I have written in Berlin, thanks to uh, not, me, not knowing so many people in Berlin and spending time in Berlin, thanks to a grant, which is really the, the reason. So anyway, uh, this is a Nervous System. I, I wrote this book with a, with a DAD uh, writers in residence in Berlin grant and um, so anyway so I'm going to 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 read a page or two so you can sort of get a sense of the the tone and the rhythm and the one of the problems she's not your mum there's no more mummy the firstborn was barking at her with his face inflamed and he snarled and showed his teeth did you forget you killed her? Did you forget? She would never forget it, even if she could not remember it. Did you forget? She could hear the past repeating like an echo. 
She heard her brother calling her a murderer or a mumderer, but she didn't understand what he meant or why her father told him to shut up. Why the firstborn defied the father and kept throwing at Ella that dart of mother and of death, murderer, mum murderer. Why the father had lost his head that time, why he'd grabbed the firstborn by the elbow and put him in a chalk hold that dislocated his shoulder and shut his mouth once and for all. To remind him of the blows once at that bar, the firstborn shielded himself behind his glass of wine and he asked, with a tongue weighed down by the past, was I such a rat? He composed a stingy smile in which Ella saw her brother's resentment, his rage, his unresolved jealousy. You were very much a rat, many rats. Ella replied, feeling her voice become poisoned because her brother had taken his revenge out on her for too many years. Rats lived only 21 months if no one took the trouble to kill them sooner, but her brother was still alive. He seemed untroubled, but Ella noticed the slight flare of his nostrils, the twitch of his eyelid, a carrion bird crossing his conscience. Years later, every time her partner brandished a shoe in her face, Ella would think of her rat of a brother. She'd swear to herself she would turn him in if he ever touched her, not realizing there was no need for it to come to blows before she left him. It was her brother who had left home what had saved her. So that's, that's a, a short fragment. Priya, why don't you follow? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read from the opening of um, my um, last book. It's only published in German so far, in Wir und Jetzt, Feminist in Werden, in Us and Now Becoming Feminist. Women who say, I will not be silenced. Women who say, it was my stepfather. Women who say, I believe you. Women who say, it was my brother. Women who say, I was too ashamed to tell. Women who say, it was my boss. Women who say, I never told anyone because I thought it was my fault. Women who say, me too. Women who say, I was nine, 14, 20, 36, 55, 70, when it happened to me. Women who say, I was afraid no one would believe me. Women who say, I didn't want to make trouble. Women who say, me too. Women who say, I refuse to be a victim. Women who say, it seems like it never stops. Women who say, I am with you. I'll tell you when you're older, my grandmother, Mamji, used to say to my sister and me when we were girls. Her revelation in all its enticing, menacing mystery hung before us like a gown we had to grow into. What exactly she would tell, I wasn't sure but I knew it would be bad. I guessed it from the way she complained constantly about how hard her life was, how unfair. I dreaded the details and still pestered her for them. Tell me now, I would say. She'd shake her head and purse her lips as if she were holding the words in against her will, protecting us from something, even as she was by slow and silent degrees, initiating us into it. What is feminist? It confronts me more and more often, this question. I accumulate definitions, work out different interpretations, linger at various intersections, 
But the question persists, what is feminist? I switch between positions, stumble through contradictions, cling to my fictions. What is feminist? I have a hundred answers or none because I cannot hold to only one. I can't recall how old I was when Mumji started to be more explicit about what she had endured. Maybe that's because, in a sense, I had always known, and the details didn't alter the knowledge, which had perhaps been in me from the moment I was born, filled me from the first with vague apprehension. Primordial knowledge, inherited, intuited, and then relearned, confirmed over and over, even in the most seemingly peaceful of scenes, through the distance bodies kept, tones of voice, glances exchanged or avoided, expressions that betrayed what the tongue dared not. Thank you. I'm wondering, um, yeah, oops, um, with, I just want to come back to something you said a bit earlier about how we think of feminism. And um, you mentioned that uh, the notion of equality is very bound up um, with this, uh, with the struggle. And um, I think one of the things that for me started to be difficult was to think um, equal to whom, um, because uh, I always thought of it first as like equal to, to men or then what the most privileged men, the most well off men. And then, but we all, we all know that this, these privileges are, are, are really, they come at a price and to who and how. And so um, this is something I really struggle with. And I, I feel as though it, things start to crumble very quickly also when, because there's almost like no, well, well, there are very few good choices you can make or they're the choices you can make which cause the least harm to others. Um, it becomes like a very, um, yeah, kind of burdensome way of, of thinking too, this thinking towards something equal, something better. And so I, I, I became really cautious about using that word equality. And then I came across um, a, a sort of definite, I wouldn't say a definition, but a, a way of just describing what feminism could be, but I, I found very sort of striking. And I just wanted to, um, to, to share it with you. So last year I read this book by um, Amiya Srinivasan um, called The Right to Sex. I think it's been a book that's been widely read and talked about. Um, and uh, it, w I, it really made me think about many things um, really hard. And I'm still not sure where I stand on some of the things in the book. But uh, she starts off by saying, feminism is not a philosophy or a theory or even a point of view. It is a political movement to transform the world beyond recognition. And I sort of love that in its openness and also the fact that we, we couldn't, we don't even know, you know, what might await us. And I wondered how you respond um, to that uh, description. Um, hmm. That's a tricky question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, actually. I haven't read this author, so I don't really know where that argument is coming from. Um, it's interesting to think that she doesn't uh, consider uh, feminism as being also a political movement or a philosophy. I think I... And again, with all the care of like not destroying an argument which I have only read a sentence of, um, or you have read it to me, rather, um, I think that um, why not all of the above? Um, for me, it is a philosophy, right? When you ask yourself, how do you want to live and how do you want to live with others? For me, that is a very philosophical question, perhaps the central philosophical question, right? And so uh, 
thinking of feminism as a philosophical position, I think is something that I agree with. I sort of, in contrast to uh, this uh, other thinker. And I also think that to produce change beyond our expectations, it won't really happen on its own. So thinking of feminism as also a, not necessarily a party, but a movement, right, which is really organizing women to, to, to respond and to produce changes in the political agenda, I think is really necessary. Um, I actually have seen things transform beyond expectations in Chile, which is where I'm from. I don't think we said this, maybe I, maybe we didn't, but it doesn't matter. So I'm from Chile, uh, born and raised, um, and I am also have lived 20 years in New York, in, uh, and now I am probably moving also out of the United States. But I have seen changes in Chile, not only in, in, in sort of in the feminist field, but in the political field more widely, that were said to be impossible. Uh, but it was people coming out to the street, people manifesting, uh, politicians moved because the street was speaking and speaking really loudly, uh, that actually even the constitution is now, a new constitution has been written. And interestingly enough, an, a new constitution has been written because the people voted and organized in movements with women and feminist organizations being really leaders of these movements to the point where the assembly that was voted by the people is half women and half men. And within that, um, sort of two, two sides or two genders, uh, there are also seats reserved or there were seats reserved for the indigenous peoples who have been called terrorists and, and uh, mistreated for centuries in Chile. So, so, the, so the part of the beyond what we can actually think of today is something that I completely agree with, but I do think that a philosophy, a feminist philosophy is there and that feminist movements, and not necessarily parties, but at least organizations are really important. To say just one more thing about the politics, um, it is the 8M movement in Chile, which is organizing a lot of the uh, uh, publicity and propaganda in order to get people uh, to vote to approve the new constitution, right, which will really change the ultra-capitalist frame that has ruled Chile for, well, since, since the dictatorship, since 1980. So I think, so, so I don't want to disagree necessarily with one part of the sentence, but I would include all of the rest. So that's, that's my take. I don't know, I mean, I, you already said that you feel very engaged with it, so let me shift. I don't know if you want to respond to that, Priya, or otherwise I have another question that was brought up by your reading, but which captured my imagination. I was really caught by the transform the world beyond recognition. Um, that really felt to me like a, something I, I, I could, um, uh, yeah, uh, I like that sense of not knowing in advance that we could actually achieve something which we can't even imagine because we're so conditioned and so trapped as, as I think our texts also um, suggest, um, you know, we, we are, we, we, uh, our minds sort of strive, but we, we come with histories and relations and loyalties and connections that, um, uh, um, that complicate everything. I mean, in, in my text, I call that the silent intersections of feminist struggle, where, you know, love and loyalty collide and good intentions and, um, and old habits crash. And, um, and so, yeah, these, these, d d d the living of it um, is always much messier um, than the than the thinking and the imagining, which of course, I mean, so necessary, all of it. Um, but I think I also wanted, like, uh, I, I like texts that also, um, like, make space for that messiness and stumbling and doubt. 
Yes, but still, I mean, activism is very messy, I have to say. And uh, very often feminists also uh, disagree and fight each other. I actually had the opportunity to talk once, not too far back with Judith Butler, who is who I'm absolute, an absolute fan of. And uh, we were talking about uh, what do you do with disagreement and different positions in feminism. And she said something that I almost tattooed on my heart, which was uh, <laughs> like lo loving, loving somebody's sentence, right? And she said, of course we're going to disagree. And she has said this later in other contexts, right? But of course we're going to disagree, but we have to, uh, we have to know, we have to be aware of who the real enemy is. So when I join other feminists that I don't necessarily like as friends, that is not a problem. We work with each other. We don't have to love each other. And I thought, that is such a great sentence, right? This sort of this idea that we all have to be friends with each other instead of thinking more politically, what do we want to do together in order to, to uh, you know, get to the place we want to get. But I mean, the, 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 the sentence that you are uh, quoting, the transformative power of being together and working together, uh, for me, is very political and it's very philosophical. That's that's what I uh, I wanted to say. Let me shift. I I, I think we're um, soon going to be out of time. Um, we've run like almost an hour, and um, we wanted to open the floor for questions. Um, so we will maybe talk a little bit more while you think about your questions, because otherwise we say, oh, questions, and there's like a five-minute silence, and we don't want to waste those five minutes. So while you're thinking of your comments, questions, criticisms, um, etc., maybe we can, we can move to the uh, sort of the obscure side of politics, uh, Priya, that we had decided to talk about, which is what's happening, for example, with... Uh, the right of abortion, the right to abortion that has now been um, overturned by the Supreme Court in the United States. Um, some people say it has been forbidden. It's really not that it has been forbidden, but it has ceased to be a right that the Constitution of the United States protects. I think that's an important clarification. Of course, many, many states in the United States were expecting uh, this to happen, were preparing for this to happen, and already had written very, very uh, harsh laws in terms of this, right? So it's kind of interesting to think that, and I, don't, I would like to hear what you think, Priya, about this. Um, for me, it's so interesting to see that the sort of the, one of the most powerful countries in the world is not only going back in terms of the right to abortion, but also is announcing that the next step is forbidding the right for contraception, basically banning the pill, or access to it, and or access to it, and then we'll go, or are announcing to go, this is Clarence Thomas' words, also marriage uh, between uh, gay people. And I think this is just the start of a really, really harsh setback. Um, and this is actually happening at the same time where in other places all these other transformative things are happening. And I, maybe we could talk a little bit about sort of the, the sort of d how hard it is to understand what is happening today and, and, and maybe also take back on the question of political organization. Yeah, um, I think that the developments in the US are really chilling and really a warning. And, the, and if anybody thinks that this couldn't happen here, I think that uh, that's really misguided <laughs> because um, these kinds of movements and these sorts of um, backlashes, they have, um, they, they, they galvanize um, other conservatives and right wingers who favor these kinds of policies. And we know that there are people in Europe and other countries like celebrating that. Um, last year, I had a, um, an online meeting um, and, and part of a feminist collective. And, and we talked to, we try to talk to different feminists 
um, movements in different places. And we talked with um, somebody in Poland who runs um, this organization called Abortion Dream Team. And so, you know, just listening to how women from there are sort of how they're brought to places like Germany, the kind of networks they have to help women. And um, so it's, it's in a way, these these things are already here. Um, and um, and it, it is it is somehow I mean, for me, the U.S. is no longer and hasn't been for a long time any kind of model for uh, democracy or progressiveness or anything. And so um, uh, it, I don't think, oh, oh, if it happens there, it could happen anywhere. Um, I just think it sort of confirms things that have been apparent um, in that in that um, nation for uh, for a while. And as you said, people were predicting this, preparing for it in different ways. Um, for a very, very long time. Um, it, and it is, it is truly disturbing, disturbing, and I think really a call to, to action, a call to alertness, to vigilance, um, that we can't assume that the things that, the rights that we have today will still be there. And as you said, the implications for other rights and not just gay marriage, but possibly even just um, intimate relations. It's, it's, really, it's really sinister. Um, and if Clarence Thomas wasn't married to a white woman, there's a chance that he might even be looking at mixed race marriages <laughs> because, you know, when you start sort of undoing these things, where, where do you stop? So um, I, I think that is really troubling. And then, as you say, incredible things happening somewhere like Chile. Um, so you, you draw hope from some things and you, you take the warning signs from others. And I think you don't assume that things will stay the way they are, wherever you are. Um, and so I think staying alert and engaged seems to me more necessary than ever organizing, supporting, um, you know, groups, NGOs uh, um, that, that have been in this fight and are, are on the front line. Um, that, 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 that seems really vital. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a really sobering um, development. Yes, yes, it's a it's a really um, one has to be. Uh, I sometimes say pessimism is the best, the sort of the worst thing. Sorry, the worst thing because you can be really chilled to inaction if you think nothing can change, right? So, but then when you pr try to practice optimism and you see these things happening. Uh, it feels very naive, right? Um, sort of what you're saying is so true that interestingly, it seems that we always have to be like with our open eyes and alert, ready to give a fight and say no, because uh, the bodies of women uh, are under are under threat. They're being controlled. So, uh, and this is in, not only in the term, terms of abortion, but in all other terms. I mean, the... It's kind of really scary, so the ways in which, at, at least coming from Latin America, the bodies of women are uh, under the, the threat of violence, under the problem of femicide. Uh, in Mexico, there's thousands of women who have disappeared and not even been claimed back. So uh, there seems to be like one of the frontiers is really the body of women, and that and power seems to be very invested in controlling these bodies in many different ways, right? So I think this this uh, maybe in, in a very sobering uh, note, uh, we can maybe interrupt here and, and uh, maybe get questions if you have questions or comments or things that you would like us to to address so that... Yes, wait a yeah. second. Oh, we have okay, great, we have a, a first intervention. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer and I am African. Mm -hmm. And listening to prayer saying uh, that uh, when you talk about equality, equality to who? And at the same time, listening to the person she was quoting who said, um, transforming the world beyond recognition. Now, I come from a culture where 
equality to men is going to heaven. Excuse me, can you repeat that last part? Uh, uh, if we are ever equal to men, it would be like what you call nirvana out mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, in my culture, we women kneel before men. We are bought by dowry by men. And when your husband buys you, he's told, oh, you've bought her dead body as well belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And our children don't belong to us, they belong to our husbands. And there are so many other ways that uh, women are oppressed that I'm not going to go to. So for us, equality to men is important. In fact, for us, equality to men is transforming the world beyond recognition. I'd, I'd like um, Priya to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. You. Thank you so much for that reflection and question. It's a, it's a really good point. And I absolutely think that that is um, a necessary target. I mean, when we think of equal pay, uh, quotas of representation, um, I, 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 I'm not at all against any of that. I fully support it. I think, I think this, 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 this struggle has to happen on many different levels. And while we try to achieve one thing, it doesn't mean we're not trying to imagine beyond it as well. Um, so I didn't in any way wish to um, to under underestimate um, those very necessary steps and efforts, which do have a transformative power in themselves. But I think part of what um, feminist thinking is about is also trying to to, to see beyond. Um, because to, to reproduce the structures of power as they exist means that somebody, th th there's always suffering, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really solve everything. And as Lena said earlier on, like if success is just to be, to have everything that a, a man has, um, that's going to be fine for a while. But, um, I don't think also because of the way the, the situation that our planet is, is in, I mean, with climate crisis, with different, with different problems pressing on us, I don't think we can all live the way the you know the kind of the men in the best positions wherever they are in the world have lived. I think we have to fig figure other ways of being together, um, and we have to do that alongside demanding the uh, the equality to men um, that you that you describe. It's, it's it's a contradictory and sort of um, almost counterintuitive way of going. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just think for me, like not stopping there is a really important part, um, of this, of this endeavor. Um, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that, Lena. If I may, um, so I think that, um, how I understood this when Priya said it and how I'm also understanding it now is that men have, and what I think you're saying, and excuse me if I ha I'm misunderstanding you, is that men have all the rights and women have no rights, basically. Men can decide everything, women can decide nothing. So when we think of equality, and I think this also happened previously in the, in the first feminist fights, when we think about this question, it's uh, the question of having or accessing the same rights, right? That the sort of the, and the same protections by the law and the same opportunities, but having the same right to exert violence on others is not what we want to be. So I think there's, of course, no, no, I, I, I see you. So there's sort of a two, there's two two levels of this. One is the opportunities, the rights, the protections, the laws. Uh, Etc., which I think I completely agree with. But then, when we, th and I think Priya was saying this precisely in the capitalist world, where women seem to want the same things that men want, but without sort of the responsibilities that they should have. So, how do we, how do we solve that complication, right? So, I think that I, I completely agree with you, and I, I see what you're saying perfectly well. I come from Latin America, we're not too far back women were also subjected to similar situations, right? 
but also the model that it has been established by men and for men is maybe not one that we want to look up to for the future. And also, if I may, just one more thought to, to add there. It's also when women um, achieve what men have, they still don't get to sort of stop doing all the other things, like all the housework and all the care and all the other duties that belong to the still to the realm mostly of women. And so uh, this is the other sort of conundrum that on the one hand to achieve access into these spaces, into the decision making, into the possibility to shape, you know, um, our societies and our public sphere and our world. And at the same time, but the transformation has to happen in the home, in our personal relations too. Because I think one of the sort of, for me, myths of the sort of capitalized feminist uh, idea is this idea that the, you can have it all, you know, you can, you can have the child, you can have the job, you can have the, uh, the husband, the family, everything. And I just don't think that's true. I think it's another lie that's, that oppresses women because you're like frantically trying to do everything. And, you know, it's, it's just not humanly possible. There are always sacrifices. There are always choices. There's always juggling. There are resources that are needed to manage everything. And in fact, one of the problems with, with this Roe v. Wade, of course, it's, it's, it's this, I mean, for people who want an abortion and don't want the child for whatever reason, but the other question is women who want to have children, but there's no support, you know, there's no social infrastructure, state care and support for that. And this is the other really disappointing thing about the, the reaction of the Democrats, which is instead of like using this as an opportunity to enshrine some basic protections and support in this other way that would make women's lives better. Uh, you know, I mean, the complaint that I've heard most from critics is that just calling for donations for their election drive. And, and so, you know, in, 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 in many different senses, the situation of women is, is seriously compromised, diminished, and, uh, you know, their health, their well-being is, um, is on the line uh, because of this. And um, and I think that the risk that things that there be slides back in other places are, um, are are really present, even as strides are being made, even as um, you know having more of what men have uh, in terms of, as we said, pay representation possibilities um, is is a valid and legitimate end. Any other question, comment, criticism? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the bodily experience. I don't know if that's a right way of saying it in your books, Lina, um, because in, I've, it's at least how I read them that through illness or through being um, pregnant or, for example, through menstruation in Fruta Podrida. Um, I think the, the body, in especially, especially the female body, is very present in your books and the experience of the body. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you if you think this is also like a feminist think, thing to include the body and the bodily experience in in your literature. Well, thank you so much for, for that question. Um, I would like to start by saying uh, that the body of women have been uh, excluded from literature, so to speak, with some exceptions. Actually, Priya wrote a brilliant essay uh, about uh, Thomas Mann, a no, uh, sort of a quite unknown novel by Thomas Mann uh, that deals with menstruation, pleasure, and illness too, right? And that was a novel that, as Priya might be able to tell you, was pretty much criticized and seen as a non, almost like a non-literary book, right? 
which made me think when I read it, when I actually heard it, because she, she uh, uh, has a, a, a recording of it, uh, how much we have had to struggle to have the bodies of women and what happens to the bodies of women be considered not a domestic and individual and uh, unlikely literary topic, right? Uh, but rather as the bodies of men have been seen as sort of universal and uh, important. Um, still, uh, for men, very, for a very long time, sort of their bodies also weren't a topic so much, right? It was more the, their ideas. So we have come a very long way to actually open up the literary territory to sort of expand it and it, it, sort of to allow women to actually be there and talk about their sort of female experiences. You mentioned uh, menstruation, but it's also maternity and it's also illness, right? All these three areas for me are areas of immense concern because not only in literature, but especially in, and more dangerously outside of lit literature, the bodies of women have never been considered as the bodies of men. For example, um, women who go to the doctor and they have much less chance when they complain about a bodily issue to be taken seriously, to be believed, and to be examined, and to be diagnosed. So there's a lot of women who actually end up dying because the doctor didn't listen or didn't believe, right? Even people that I know. And so it's not, not like something happening in very, you know, off the beaten path places, no, in cities even. So, so when you ask, is it a feminist thing to do to write about the bodily experience and the, and the bodies of women, I, I have come to realize that it is. Uh, paying attention and not sort of drawing back and not thinking, oh, my novel is not going to succeed because it's not doing the regular thing. And I've been writing for more than 20 years. I think, it, not that I planned for it, but it was my area of concern. And now I realize that I was actually breaking a sort of rule, talking about, for example, the sexuality of young women, talking about disease, which is really not a trendy topic. Um, talking about uh, not being a mother and choosing not to be a mother and criticizing the discourses that uh, sort of impose maternity. All of these things I, I, I have realized that they're actually quite political to do. So thank you, thank you for that question. And I think maybe Priya wants to talk a little bit about that novel uh, by Thomas Mann and her, I don't know if you want to address any of what I just said, Priya. Just add to, um, thank you so much for mentioning that. It's, it's the, the, no, the novella is called The Black Swan by Thomas Mann. And uh, the, the essay that I wrote about is called Bloody Man, in case you want to search for it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, as, as um, Alina mentioned, it, it was panned by critics and it was called Disgusting and um, because he talks about the menopause and the changes to this woman's body in such an intimate way. Um, and um, I just wanted, it made me think also of um, the book by Caroline Criado Perez, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And exactly as Lena said, like the whole world is arranged as though the default human being is a man. So, you know, until recently crash test dummies in cars had like the standard male size. So cars were generally safer for men than women, even though, you know, <laughs> even though we're sort of, yeah, loads of women drivers. I mean, medical research, as we know, women were included in trials for so long. Um, just air conditioning in, in offices, it's usually set slightly too cold for women because uh, that's more comfortable for men. And so I, I know when, I remember when I read this book, I just felt like the discrimination in a way that I, I hadn't really, you know, even in my, like just this reading experience was so, sort of um, confronting and, uh, and upsetting. Um, and so I think, yeah, the body is so important as a site where these things play out, um, as Lena already said. And this is what I find so inspiring and powerful about Les Tessis as well, because 
they i mean one is like so this movement you know you can talk about it better than i can but but, but their chant has also physical moves and they they really locate the violence of the, the state the police the courts you know they bring it back to the body and and they say i think i can't remember um exactly what the line but it's something like the oppressive state is a, is a macho rapist and and they keep repeating the rapist is you and uh, i mean this is such a kind of I, 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 such a powerful confronting charm and um i remember i i saw it for the first time actually a bit a bit late it, um, they were in the how in 2020 in berlin and um, the, the 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 a few of the women who 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 uh, written this and they performed it and um i just remember just crying through the whole thing and just being overwhelmed by how they managed to capture in this chant the kind of architecture of patriarchy and i was in a talk at the end of last year with a lawyer who um and, and legal scholar who's done a lot of work on, on the german penal code in terms of how sexual offenses are dealt with and and i had asked for a, a, a bit of this lastesis um chant to be played um, because I thought, you know, this this captures like the problem in such a concise and urgent and powerful way. And she was really offended by this. And she said, oh, I don't I, I don't think it's appropriate that the word rape is thrown around like that. Um, and and I, and I, 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 I at that time, I don't know, I, in that moment, I didn't manage to react as lucidly as sometimes you, you don't manage it in the moment. But this is also what conversation is for, I think. But conversations are to push our thoughts, so we keep thinking afterwards, and then you know we, we have our arguments for later or the next time. And what I thought afterwards was that I mean, the word first of all was not thrown around; it was very carefully, you know, uh, sort of composed um, to address certain problems. And um, and what also then became clear to me is that just as naming whiteness means identifying racialized power and privilege. I think naming institutions and structures as a rapist is to identify gendered, which is to say male domination and violence. And, and this kind of incredible sort of brilliance of this, um, I think it has become for me such a kind of light in this feminist, um, in this feminist becoming you know exploring being um and so even in in these in these times when there's so much that's so difficult um i have to say lena chile is really a beacon uh, there was a there was an amazing article in in the new yorker recently about gabriel boric and uh, uh he just sounds fantastic and, and his and his partner and she said something so cool she was she said well I'm going to have to rethink this role of first lady because I'm not first and I'm not a lady. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, to have that kind of thing said, like, and, you, and as you said, it started from the bottom, but now something like that is said also at the top. And so, um, yeah, I feel very excited about what bodies can, I mean, awful things are done to bodies, but what bodies can also bring to being um as as that uh, particular movement has shown and is showing um i just wanted to ask because i'm not sure how i feel about it um but like looking around this room it seems like there are mostly women or women identified people here to speak uh, or to listen um, so I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts are on kind of pulling men into the project of feminism, um, whether that's necessary or like what role do they play? I guess I'm, I'm just very unclear about, um, about how I feel about it and I feel like most of the discussions I have about feminist and feminist ideas happen with women. And I find it can be challenging to have those discussions with men. Um, or you're really kind of starting at base level and uh, kind of explaining a lot of things that feel very common sense. Anyway, so I just kind of wanted to get your take on, on that. 
Do you want to choose who will start? <laughs> Please do, because that makes our lives easier. Okay. So, um, oh, that's a that's a that's a very uh, poignant question, actually. So, should women include men into the feminist movement? Right. That's that's the question, and um, I think that. I'm also not sure about what I think, I have to confess. And I contradict myself often on this regard. Because on the one hand, I feel that uh, the transformative power of women is, is sort of directed uh, to power in a different way. And that many times we want to march on our own and feel together among us. Uh, we don't want to be protected because that is giving the man a role, a, a sort of a conventional role. We want to protect each other um, and see what the police does when they only confront women because if there's men around, there's also an excuse for violence. And so, and so all of these things happen and there have been, uh, I know, in. in in Chile, I am speaking of Chile mostly here, uh, where men have wanted to join to show support to their sisters, mothers, daughters, partners, friends. And they have received a very um, um, loud no. We don't want you here. So is that excluding men? Well, I don't think it's really excluding men. We have been excluded so much that like having them feel a little excluded for five minutes or for five hours, I don't think it's very uh, something that one should say I'm sorry about. But, but perhaps I think that is, is, is an opportunity that no, we need to do this alone uh, to on the one hand uh, avoid mansplaining and also avoid something that feminists do complain a lot about, having to always educate the man. So it's like, why don't you educate yourselves? Why don't you think about your masculinity? Why don't you think about your toxic masculinity? Why don't you say, I'm sorry I said that, I will be more careful next time, instead of repeating that attitude and making one feel guilty? Right, And so a lot of feminist women and younger women are saying today, you know, yeah, the pedagogy, et cetera, but why do we always have to do everything? We have to work, we have to raise the children, educate the children, educate ourselves. All is put on the shoulders of women. So I, I do think that it's interesting that women are able to say, no, this is, this, you know, there's books, you know, hello. <laughs> Libraries, you don't even have to buy them. Uh, on the other hand, I also think that, that it's uh, important to include the men, especially the younger men, in our conversation. So excluded from some activities maybe that we need to do on our own, and then also being able to have a conversation that will open up certain things. So I tend to say like, oh, you know, there's this really good book that you should read. And I think that's been more useful than having to do it on my own with my partner, so to speak. So that, that's, that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to say that I have been, I mean, I was, not, I don't want to say I was disappointed because I'm very happy to see you here. But it's true that in conversations about feminism, it's, it's sort of exceptional, and thank you, the guys who are here, exceptional to have men, which would be an educational opportunity without having to, to, to know, subject your partner to educate you and to feel sometimes very uncomfortable. So, so it's, it's a pity that that's that way, but at the same time, I do feel, and I don't, can't speak for Germany, but I can speak for Chile, where I am finding personally that more and more men are reading women, which was not my case when I started writing. And also, for my surprise, my book on maternity, on, on not being women or against children, um, has been read by a lot of men. I do find a lot of men in the line to sign my books and to say, I read this with my partner and we discussed your book. 
And even once there was this old man who was, I don't know why, sitting at a launch of this book, and he came with a book in his hand and said, you know, I insist to my, I tell my daughter all the time that I want to be a grandfather. While I hear you, I have rethought. It's like a 60-year-old man, right? And I was completely taken aback because this is surprising. And he said, so I'm buying your book to read it first, and then I will give it to my daughter. And I thought, wow, so there is the possibility of having a conversation, but I also think that we shouldn't feel obliged to educate the man and bring him along or even accept him to come when we want to be on our own. So maybe that's, that's helpful to clarify my own, my own thoughts on this. Thank you for the question. Priya. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't have so much to add because I share so much of what you said. But by the way, in case we also give the impression that we are in constant agreement, <laughs> Lena and I, for all for all that we share, um, we have all time had uh, productive disagreements. Um, I, I'll never forget how Lena was one of the the first person who said to me years ago when she met me that I had to learn German because it, she said you don't want to be. Uh, she said it's it's lovely that your husband can navigate so much for you, but you don't want to be in a country where you can't manage any situation on your own because you don't have the language. And um, it wasn't until about six years later that I was ready to really um, face that and take that in. Um, and yeah, there have been many moments along the way where uh, frankness um, has uh, has been a, a gift, even if it took a while for the um, for the insight um, to to sink in and take effect. Um, I one of the things that I find really um, challenging is so there's a question of whether men want to um, really engage with this or not and the ones who come and the ones who read um, um, but, but there are other ways in which especially I think as as people who have the the privilege and the opportunity to be in public you also um, encounter men in situations where certain kind of misogynistic behaviors patterns play out and then the question is like, in, in a public setting, how does one deal with this? Can that be used as a pedagogic situation or as a situation in which you practice something that um, you are, you know, um, yeah, thinking about and, and, and grappling with? Um, I find that a lot of guys ha have got very practiced with, you know, kind of um, doing the spiel on being feminist and, um, Sort of gesturing to uh, to to yeah these the, these things. So for instance, I mean the, the the typical and awful thing you see is when you get um, three or four guys on a panel. They're like, oh, there should have been a woman here. And I just like I really want to be able to stand up and say, you know, how come nobody said that before you all accepted the invitation? Like when you do you ask who else is there and then say I'm not coming unless. So I just find things like that just not no longer acceptable, but I don't have the, the still the courage to be the one who stands up and says, oh, please, you know, <laughs> give me a break. So I think that there might be moments where, you know, it, it, it can be, I mean, I don't mean like not, not, not to shame and to confront, but where it, it could be done just to kind of not, not play into the kind of superficial, um, oh, uh, we are actually, this is part of our concerns, but somehow coincidentally, it, it didn't, it didn't manifest here. Um, and so I think I kind of put more onus on myself to be more outspoken in those moments, um, than to, tr to, cause I, I agree with Lena that this, this task of like, who, where do you put your energies? Um, one has to prioritize, but I think sometimes I feel that responsibility, um, of uh, yeah, using certain moments to, to, to make a point where um, it would just yeah feel feel not right to, to let it go. So um, uh, it's yeah, it's I think it's a really it's a really difficult question, and um, I think it's uh, I, I'm glad you brought it up, and uh, I think it's maybe something one negotiates yeah at, with each individual and in each instance. Um, I don't think there's one answer for all. 
um, situations as often with these these kinds of questions, which is also why it's such hard work because there's no one way to go. Yes. Hello, my name is Vivi. Uh, thank you so much um, so far for all the interesting ideas and uh, inspirations. Um, I just have a question regarding what your stance is to include literature by, by women in, in normal education, because I feel sometimes it is like those topics are quite um, talked about in a very limited scope in terms of, okay, in like, gender studies, cultural studies within the university frame, yeah, the, those, you know, those topics are being discussed, but I feel still within education, like normal education, mm -hmm. where, sh yeah, where and when should we start to kind of like include, um, include the, yeah, those topics and how, yeah, and what, what is the role of including feminist, uh, yeah, feminist literature, literature on racism, on colonialism within schools and education. Yes, uh, did you hear the question, Priya? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, follow? Yeah. Should, should I, do, would you like me to start this time? Um, I mean, I, I, I think in, in your question, you, you, you brought something that is so vital, like the sooner the better. Um, because we are so shaped by, you know, what we encounter and when, and um, the, our educational literary landscape is, I think, still so narrow. I mean, I, I don't know so much about German, the German schooling system, but I know a bit about the British, and um, the, it has got more diverse, that's absolutely for sure. But still, um, I think there's, I, I don't know how you would go about sort of advocating for that. Um, I guess one has to sort of get in touch with local politicians, school boards, um, maybe like put together lists also of um, possible texts, because sometimes people just say, oh, but we don't know, or there isn't anything. I mean, this is also one of the regular excuses. There aren't any women, there aren't any, you know, um, black people or these kinds of ridiculous excuses that just don't hold. Um, so I, yeah, that would be maybe a beginning, but I, I'm, and I'm sure there must be initiatives also that are already trying in that direction. Um, I, I, one of the things that was a self-corrective for me about five years ago is that I started reading uh, only women for a few years and many more writers in translation and also many more um, writers, uh, black writers, people of color, because I, I realized that my whole educational kind of heritage was just steeped in white male writers and mostly in English as well. Um, and I fear that is really the way many people are still being educated. And it's so hard to unlearn and learn again. So the sooner these things become um, just part of what's around us, I think, um, the better, and it couldn't happen fast enough. Yeah, and uh, not to, to uh, iterate on uh, Priya, but um, when I was growing up, and I think I mentioned this at the very beginning, um, I found it really hard to find women writers. Uh, when I was in my 20s, of course, under dictatorship, I mean, the, the whole thing was not easy at all, right? But uh, as a professor, as a teacher, I have really devised not only uh, the sort of put on myself to, and I teach at the university level, so I know that for schools it's much different because schools are commanded to teach certain things and there's curriculums to follow, etc. Uh, but I have sort of the privilege to, to teach a little bit of a higher level and I have really uh, dictated to myself or mandated myself to find a way of at least having 
you know, the point of view of women writers in the courses. And for example, one of the challenging things uh, was I teach a course on war. And war is precisely one of those subjects which seems to be an only masculine subject. But actually, when you do the research, you find that, you know, I mentioned Virginia Woolf, of course, but Marguerite Duras uh, wrote extensively on their, the period under war. And there's plenty of philosophers who have thought about violence um, and so on and so forth, and artists who have created uh, art and literature uh, on war. So eventually, my course is almost an, uh, a, a, an entire course on really mostly texts, films, and uh, arts by women. So one, ha one has been told that the text, texts do not exist. What is so interesting is that one does find the text if you really look hard, and, and one has to really look hard. But even for, you know, back in, in the day of the French Revolution, I, for example, found, and this is when I was teaching a course on revolution, also a very masculine topic, that I found a woman called Olympie de Gauche, who was a, like a, at the time a very radical feminist, who of course was beheaded after uh, Queen Antoinette, right, because she, went so far as to rewrite the French uh, um, Declaración de los Derechos del Hombre y de, la, y de la Ciudadano, the Declaration of Rights of Men and French Citizen, uh, and she rewrote it in an inclusive way. So she started including women and in everything and then included a small clause on women. And I put that in my class just to start because I felt that that was so, so interesting that that was happening and we're still discussing inclusiveness in our laws, right? So I think that there's on the one hand, the exercise of looking for and looking hard and asking and, and, and finding, but then the other thing is where you cannot find text by women, how about reading a text by a man in a, under a feminist light? and think about gender issues happening in these texts. Why are women not there? Why are they flat characters? Why are they only fighting for men, right? Why are they committing suicide because they're adulterous? Is the author punishing this woman, right, in his book just to tell every woman reader that she has to be a faithful wife? Well, et cetera, et cetera, right? So how is maternity represented? So even in texts, fully by men, you can apply a gender reading. And not only a gender reading in those terms, but you can also find moments of um, uh, men sort of engaging with men in ways that are not common, right? There's a lot of gay issues, oops, gay, um, my hands are moving everywhere. <laughs> gay issues also occurring, right, in text. There's a lot of racial issues happening in texts, right? The, the entire notion of slavery and how it was dealt with, for example. And, and per, those are times where you not very often find a, a slave or an ex-slave who could write his own text. But you can, you can look at the racial issues that are inscribed in these texts. And that is very educational, I think. So even if you have to follow a really set curriculum, you can teach how to read. Uh, in a different way, in a feminist way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, yeah, maybe do last we have to question? finish? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What time do we have? Wow, this is yes. like a feminist workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so hard to follow up on these really great questions. Um, so my question really um, endured in the first part of our talk today, or of your talk today, um, about labeling or the wording of feminists, that like labeling yourself a feminist in the 60s or 70s were not like a good thing or like a negative connotated. And then it became kind of trendy and, and good, but I feel like now it's negative again a little mm. bit. So, and that's what I wanted to ask you, um, is to label myself, if I, like if you think about your grandma, like she did not claim herself a feminist, but she was one, and she was like, a, and also like Audre Lorde, or big, big figures that brought on this process, they did not like claim the word for themselves. And today, 
is it maybe, like I thought maybe we have to look critical sometimes because people just say, oh, I'm a feminist, but then they don't act like one. And so is it like getting more negative again? What mm. do you think about that? And also is, um, can we like naturalize it? Like, is it important to say, I am a feminist, so people know? Or can I just try to not claim myself as one and just act more like one and be like, hey, that's just natural. Of course I'm a feminist. Like, I don't have to label it. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I hope it was understandable. What no, I yes, it's a, it's a very, very good question. There's actually a, a, a text that I think you would enjoy reading by Jessa Crispin, uh, Why I Am Not a Feminist. It's actually a feminist manifesto, right? It's yeah. a, so it's a really, really against the grain kind of book uh, because she's very critical of the misuse and the abuse of the term feminism. It's like, oh, okay, now I'm a feminist, so I can do whatever because if I choose to do it, that's great because I'm a woman and I'm empowered. And the word empowered uh, has become a really discussed word, right? What does it mean to gain power and what kind of power are you gaining? Um, so, I mean, for me, the most important thing is never the label, because labels can be appropriated and misused, but really internalizing a sort of an ethics and a, and a way of being with others that is informed by feminism. So, I mean, I think, like, you ask me what, I, what you should do, I cannot tell you what you should do with, your, with your, the way you identify that would be very anti-fluid and that's not the mo this is not the moment to do that. But I think that uh, you, I mean, if this is helpful, I think that for me the most important thing here is the content, not the labeling. Um, you can call yourself whatever, I, what I matter, I mean, this is a, the, uh, there's a discussion about this like, uh, it's more important your action than what you say you do. Most people say they do things they don't. And they're using what they say to give themselves some sort of prestige. So I think that people will recognize that you're a feminist if you act feminist, I think, yeah. Uh, Pri, I didn't want to leave you outside of the conversation, so if you wanna. Thank you, no, not, not at all. I, I'm really enjoying listening. Um, and, and I completely agree with you that it's the actions that, um, that count more. And um, for me, just, uh, I think, to, to take on that mantle was also to take on a responsibility to myself um, to keep grappling with this term with, with all its kind of spikes and difficulties and wonders. And so, and also at this moment, I think when there is so much like being taken away from women, when there is so much violence being inflicted upon women, for me, it was uh, a, a kind of way of committing to something to take this to say i'm a feminist um and to also with an awareness as all of you have and have uh, articulated um of this sort of uneasiness that, that that comes with it um but that comes with so many of the the terms the concepts that we cherish and which we we want to define how we think i mean things like democrat you know um, uh, anti-racist, all, all these terms like have, as Lena said, they can be um, misused, appropriated, um, but they, 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 they hold us, I think, to, to accountable in certain ways. And I think that readiness to do the thinking, to do the work, to act is finally the most decisive thing. And how you decide that for yourself is always a personal, personal decision and can change also. Um, in the course of um, of a life, um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, I feel very um, sort of inspired and delighted to have been able to to have this kind of exchange uh, from here um, in my in my living room in Mitte. By the way, I was so embarrassed sitting in front of the shelf because this is like the old side of the living room, and they're all guys. And so I tried to move the postcards to cover some of the names a bit. And um, <laughs> so I feel like I'm still kind of grappling with this thing of what it is to be feminist and have a shelf loads of books <laughs> by old white men, some of whom I, I still really love. 
So uh, yeah, it's we can still <laughs> we can still read books by men <laughs> under a critical lens. So so you know this can be all your your nasty guys uh, shelf. Uh, which you've been critical well, of. Well, like I, said, I, I really love some of them still. So yeah, it, it, that, that's the thing again, it's the lens and the awareness and um, yeah, the constant practice. Well, thank you very much, Lina Merwane and Priya Basil. And thank you everyone for your time and your patience. And why don't we just continue the conversation with a glass of champagne? Because oh. actually, it's the last night before the summer break, so I have some champagne for you or water, if you like. And Priya, please stay online for a little bit longer so we can include you somehow in the conversation. Um, also, there's a book table. You can buy the books of Priya Basile and, of course, also Lina, Lina Merwane. Would you also sign, be willing yes, to sign course, if someone... Yes, of course. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much for this wonderful last evening before the summer break. Have a great summer. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.